Hello and welcome once again to Coding in My Sleep. As usual, I am your host David Perry, and this is one of my most requested and longest awaited videos ever. Welcome to everything you need to know about Bitcoin cold storage. Okay, not everything that you need to know. As it turns out, Bitcoin cold storage is kind of a big complex topic. There's a lot of information that you need to have to even understand most of the topics that we're going to talk about, and that's the purpose of this video. I struggled for a long time trying to fit all of it into a single video, and it just didn't work. So welcome to Coding in My Sleep's first ever multi-part series. Now in subsequent videos, we are going to build and then use a cold storage system with this a relatively inexpensive netbook that my brother-in-law purchased to hold his own Bitcoin stash. Now of the Bitcoiners that I've spoken to, this is the most common methodology, but that doesn't mean that's where this series is going to stop. There are lots and lots of very effective methods for cold storage, and we're going to explore as many of them as I have time to film. But before we can do any of that, you have to know the basics, and that's what this video is going to teach you. I'm sorry to the veterans out there, this one's going to be a little bit introductory, but stick around anyway, you might pick up a couple of things. So the first concept that you have to understand to really grasp what's happening with cold storage is the concept of split key cryptography. That sounds like really big complex words, but I assure you it's not. Basically what it amounts to is that older systems used one secret to sign messages and secure information. And if I were trying to communicate a message with you and I wanted to encrypt it or sign it, we would both have to know the key that we were going to use ahead of time. We're very accustomed to these kinds of secrets. For example, every time you swipe your credit card, you are sending your key, your credit card number, to a merchant services company who indirectly is sending it to your bank. Your bank already knows your credit card number, so really all they're doing is looking to make sure everything matches. If it does, they know you're you, and you're allowed to spend from your account. Of course, this also reveals a fundamental flaw in the credit card processing system, which is that you have to reveal your key in order to use it. Even if you didn't have to reveal it, you're probably not storing it very securely, and the fact that systems that are connected to the internet have to act on that secret every time you spend makes it inherently problematic. The good news, because it's centralized, there's someone who has the ability to roll back transactions. Bitcoin takes a different approach. Rather than making the transactions reversible, which causes a huge number of both technical and economic problems, we simply make the transactions harder to fake. We use better secrets in better ways. Bitcoin uses a methodology called public key message signing, specifically ECDSA, or the Elliptic Curve Discrete Signature Algorithm. Now, the way ECDSA works, and in fact the way all public key cryptography systems work, is that you start off with a secret, just like you have with your credit card number, only much longer, and you derive from that secret a second secret. While different systems handle it in different ways, what's important to take away is that the second key, the public key, is generated from the first, the private key, mathematically, in a way that is impossible to reverse. Now what makes these systems work is the mathematical relationship between the keys. Again, this varies from system to system, but what's important is that we can use one key to mathematically prove we hold the other. Because of the relationship between the two, you can do math on some arbitrary message using the private key in such a way that it can be verified using the public key. This is important because there's no requirement in any of that mathematics that you actually reveal the private key. It can sit safely on its own device, doing its own thing, perfectly secure, and you can prove you hold it simply by signing messages with that device. As long as the device remains secure, the key remains secure. This means that we've taken the big, crazy, complex problem of Bitcoin security and reduced it to the much simpler, already mostly solved problem of securing a physical object. Now to understand why this air gap is important and how the whole system works, you also need to understand a little bit about the way a Bitcoin transaction takes place. While it only seems like one thing is actually taking place when you send bitcoins using your favorite wallet, in fact, at least three distinct things are occurring behind the scenes. First, we're generating a transaction, 
then we're signing it, and then we're broadcasting it. Now in this first step when we're generating the transaction, it's very useful to be connected to the internet. The internet can be used to fetch very useful pieces of data like the balances of your addresses, or the exchange rate so that you can send the appropriate amount of coin. In the third step, we're actually broadcasting the transaction to the Bitcoin network, so being connected to that network, usually via the internet, is an absolute requirement. But the second step, signing the transaction, only requires a device that knows the private key and can do relatively complex math. There's lots of those laying around. As a matter of fact, there are a tremendous number of devices that can do exactly the kind of math that we're talking about, and most of them could be used for some kind of cold storage system. Now, the hardware requirements for this kind of digital signing are relatively low, so it would be easy to create a small embedded device to handle Bitcoin signatures, and I do expect that this is where things will go in the future. However, to my knowledge, no one has yet implemented such a thing, so we're stuck making videos about Acer netbooks. Still, Bitcoin tends to appreciate in value fairly rapidly and unexpectedly, so in the process of waiting for these cool new embedded systems to come about, you may see your net worth double or triple, and then be caught with your pants down. It's happened to me. Over the course of the next couple of videos, we're going to build and then learn how to use a cold storage solution based on the popular Bitcoin wallet software, Electrum. From there, we'll move on to paper wallets, Kasaskius coins, and any number of other ways to turn your virtual assets into physical assets that can be much more easily secured. Unfortunately, that'll all have to wait for other videos because that's all the time I've got today. Thanks for watching, everyone, and if you've gotten anything out of this video, feel free to send any tips and donations you feel appropriate to this address right here. This address is unique to this piece of content, so by sending in funds, you're not only making it possible for me to continue my work, but you're also voting with your wallet and telling me what it is that you liked. Thanks for watching, everyone.